1975 Cal State Los Angeles. Ivy Bettini. I was supposed to get married. Now, Eddie and I went out for about a year, maybe a little longer. And he, he is a very decent, loving man, very gentle. And so now the week I'm supposed to get married, that's Saturday. And all of a sudden, I wake up on Monday and I can't swallow. I can chew a lot, <laughs> but it won't go down, you know. Uh. And so by midweek, um, I called my mom's twin sister, who was always, I was always very close to. She was like my favorite. And um, <clears throat> she said, all right, I'll come over. So, okay, so she comes over, but it's still not doing it, but I can eat a little bit. So I call my doctor, my regular doctor that had from the time I was little, mm -hmm. I went to this man. And <clears throat> I, I explained, I said, I can chew, but I, I, you know, it's like my throat is locked up. And he said, well, what's going on? And I said, oh, I forgot to say, I'm getting married. <laughs> so he said, well, I don't think it's physical, so why don't you go talk? There's a psychiatrist friend of mine, and why don't you go talk to him? Now, nobody back there. No, of course not ever said the word psychiatrist, therapist. I mean, I don't even think the word therapist was around. It was psychiatrist. And I could feel myself going, oh my God. And so he said, here's the phone number and call him up. And so I, so I did and uh, made an appointment with him. And, and I thought, well, I can't let anybody know I'm going to a psychiatrist. And so I didn't take my car because I was so active in sports. <laughs> uh -huh that I had a little, I had a little 36 Ford, 1936 Ford, and I was so active in sports, I just assumed everybody on Long Island would see my car and know exactly where I was going. Uh -huh. That's how crazy you, you, of course. you, you know, oh my God. 
So I took the bus, and I hate the bus, to this, I won't even ride the bus today. <clears throat> so I take the bus, and it's about a 35-minute ride to Freeport from where I live. So I go over there, and I go into the building, go up, and I go into this waiting room, and the door opens, and a, and a voice says, come in. And so I walk into this room. Now, Sheila, this is all I remember of, I'm assuming, a session. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I walk in, and here is this man sitting behind this big psychiatrist mahogany desk. You know, as you, when you think of a psych, you know, uh -huh. huge desk. And it felt like he was like 18 miles away from me. And I walked in, and I stood in front of his desk. He didn't even, he didn't even say, sit down. Hmm. I stood there, and he said, um, why are you here? And I didn't expect that question. And so out of my mouth fell, I think I love women. It was like, I think I love women. You know? And then I went, where did that come from? Because wow. I had never even formulated those words in my mind. I just went boom. And so he, as he said to me, and, I, and this is all I remember the session, he said to me, have you ever kissed a woman? And I, and, I, and I was shocked. I said, no, I had never even thought of it. Mm -hmm. I said, no. And he said, you are not homosexual, just like that. <laughs> and he said, he said, go get married and cleave. He actually used the word cleave. Even then I knew that was a word that was weird. Uh -huh. And he said, and cleave unto your married friends. Because I had all these sports friends, all these basketball buddies, right, and the occasion, baseball ones. Uh, the hockey. occasion of sin. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, and he even said, and give up your basketball team, which I was coaching. Mm -hmm. You know, give up all of that and cleave until you marry friends. Mm. That's all I remember from the session. And so, you know, I think I genuflected and kissed his ring. I'm not <laughs> sure. But I left and, and I got married that Saturday. Mm. And I did exactly what he told me, gave up all my sports, mm -hmm. and I cleaved, cleaved, clothed to all my married friends and fell in love with them. Mm -hmm. So nothing changed, right. you know, I just shifted locations where the women, I fell in love with my friend Esther Siegel, you know, and a woman at, at my job, well, I was working for Newsday, so, you know, I had a woman I was in love with it at my job and in my social circle. So it was mm -hmm. very nice, but mm -hmm. they never knew it. Mm -hmm. You know, but that was my experience of trying to deal with what I was feeling. That was the limited experience I had, never to be spoken of again until many, many years later. I am here to talk about what it's like to grow a female. And to give you an illustration, let's see, um, the best illustration I can give you is that, um, well, women sort of have a special place in the world. And to let you know where we really are, there are some words that are unique to us, to our femaleness, that have nothing to do with men, nothing whatsoever to do with men. They're very personal words. Such words as menstruation <laughs> and <laughs> men oh, pause. <laughs> And uh, listen, the next one, fellas, uh, fella, uh, <laughs> if you like it so much, you really could have it back, is serectomies. <laughs> and those three words sort of sum up where we are in the hearts of <clears throat> mankind. Um, Lesbians. <laughs> lesbians. You know, there really are a bunch of myths going around about lesbians. I mean, the myth is that Gay women hate men. They don't have to. They don't live with them. <laughs> <laughs> probably has been to all of the dyke marches, but marches for so many good causes, for marches for this community, and is one of our strongest voices, the chair of our Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board, a West Hollywood resident, and my friend, Ivy Botini. Right. I, I just want to say something really brief, and that, um, we need to march with some anger tonight. You know, when those doors open, it's going to be one big party for the rest of the weekend. 
But we have to march with some anger tonight because we are in incredibly bad territory. There is so much going to come down on us, we won't know what's hit us. And we've got to start gearing up our anger glands so that when it starts hitting, we're going to be ready to do something about it and get out of the bars and stop the dance for a weekend or whatever you have to do. But we are going to be attacked and, and it's going to be really bad. It's going to be worse than the Briggs Initiative. It's going to be worse than any of the AIDS initiatives. It's going to be bad. So let's march with anger and pride and determination that we're not going back. Wherever they want us to go, we're not going there. What were those issues of greatest importance to you at that time, and what was the political consciousness that you were trying to develop? This was back in the 60s? Right. Well, the political consciousness was um, nothing about feminism. I mean, people didn't even understand what feminism, they still don't understand. A lot of people still don't understand. And the climate was one of either uh, outright scorn or ridicule. Uh, there didn't, didn't seem to be uh, anything in the middle. People either laughed at the feminist movement or they, they somehow were afraid of it on some level and so they would, you know, throw epitaphs at it. Um, back there, if, I mean, it was harder, <laughs> it really was harder to say that you were a feminist than it was to say you were a lesbian. I mean, it was real interesting. Um, what well, almost is today. Yeah, well, uh, feminist has become a dirty word akin to liberal. That's right. And at some moment, I'd like you to define feminist, perhaps as it originally was understood. In, oh, it's so simple. Today. May I do it now? Right now. Right now, feminist uh, feminism is equality between the sexes, socially, politically, uh, and personally, and that's the definition of feminism. But what were you, in terms of specific issues, you weren't philosophers then in the late 60s, you were dealing, or maybe you were to some degree, but you were also dealing with real issues. And well, what was of the greatest concern there? Well, it started out pretty much uh, for equal pe pay for equal work, um, uh, parental rights and divorce and um, marriage rights and um, desexagrating the want ads, you know, getting away, this was a man's job, and this was a woman's job. And as the time went on in the first, say, like three years, three years, the first three years, everything was moving really fast. And in, let's see, we started in 1966, and in 1968, uh, the New York chapter introduced into the New York State Legislature the incredible thought that a woman should have control over her own body. I mean, that was a monumental thought, you know. I mean, it came like, what do you mean a woman should control her own body? Because up to now, a woman's body seemed to belong to the state. And in many ways, people are still trying to make it so. We have been too safe for too long that we think it's how it's going to stay. It's not going to stay. We are on, a, on the brink of losing it. And there will be people in this community, in this crowd, that will not vote in November. Shame! 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 cards here. I brought some and, and uh, Lauren has a whole bunch of them. I hope they're being passed out. If you haven't voted you and if you aren't registered, please do so. November is so important. I can't tell you. It's like... like this is where I am supposed to be saying this get off your asses yeah. 
I'm on your tail and I'm watching you. Thank you! It wasn't just working on an issue. To me, everything is creativity, everything. And you can, you can win a cause with music. You can do it on the stage. You know, it's just a, a, a different medium that you're operating in, but it's the same story. Activism is one of the most exciting things to, to do. Because if you believe in what you're doing, it's your insides, it's your belief, it's your it, it's your faith that you can get it done. I mean, it's, you just have to step out of the box. Hello, everyone. My name is Dottie. I want to welcome you. We are so glad you joined us for the celebration of Ivy Bettini, of a life well lived. It is not possible to capture the depths and breadth of Ivy Bettini, but we gave it a good try. Although cliche, it is true that thanks is not a big enough word to acknowledge the incredible committee that has put this tribute together. Ivy was clear that she wanted Terry DiCrescenzo to help plan her memorial. And I've had the privilege of co-chairing this remembrance planning with Terry, who is a pleasure to work with. Thank you, Terry. And we have had the honor of working with a dedicated, multi-talented technical team who have put in endless hours to create this presentation. Huge thanks to committee members, Sue Sexton, Marna Deach, Karen Ayers, and Rita Gonzalez. And super thanks to Yvette Stello for her special video editing contributions and to Lynn Ballin for driving our social media presence. And thanks to Amy Ross for bringing the wonderful team at the One Institute and Archives and the one archives at USC Libraries into this project. And now to you, Amy. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this very special, special celebration of life for a remarkable woman who was truly larger than life itself. We have so very many people to thank who have contributed time, energy, photos, and personal tributes to today's event. Today would not have been possible without the One Archives Foundation and the One Archives at USC Libraries. We would like to give our special thanks to One Archives Foundation Executive Director, Jennifer Gregg, Archivist, Lonnie Shibuyama, Director of Content Strategy, Umi Su, Director of Education, Eric Adamian, and Communications Manager, Jamie Shear Cohen. Their artistry will be on full display today for you to appreciate throughout this celebration. And finally, our deepest gratitude to the numerous Friends of Ivy's who've contributed photos, remembrances, and their remarkable artistry and talents to today's event. Their names will be listed at the completion of today's program. We express our deepest gratitudes. And as a reminder, today's video is being recorded and will be available for viewing in the near future. So please join us and think a warm thought for Ivy and honor her along with us. And now please welcome our host for today, the one and only Terry DiCrescenzo. Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you, uh, Dottie. Uh, clearly Gloria Steinem needs little or no introduction. She's uh, nationally known as the leading spokesperson for the American feminist movement. Uh, of course, she's a founder of Ms. Magazine, journalist, social political activist, the list goes on and on. Uh, Gloria wasn't able to send a video for today and so asked me to read the following remarks from Gloria Steinem. I mourn the passing of my friend Ivy Bottini, an early feminist organizer who knew that feminism included all women by definition. When we both were no longer in New York, but at opposite ends of the country, I wasn't able to see Ivy as often as I wished to, but I always knew she was representing compassion and respect for each unique human being. Now, if we can say to ourselves going forward, what would Ivy do? She will continue to guide us and be with us still. I thank you, Gloria. Sheila Kuehl, currently the member of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors who represents the third district, uh, Supervisor Kuehl became the first openly gay California legislator in 1994. 
She was also the first woman in California history to be named Speaker Pro Tem of the California State Assembly. We have a wonderful video of Ivy interviewing Sheila, followed by remarks from Sheila. Cue the video. So you're um, working at Newsday. <clears throat> Did you go to work at Newsday? Have two little girls. Yep. Um, takes us into the 60s, I think. A, sort of a, yeah. a dangerous time for all of us. Time of incredible change and transition. And was that true in your life as well? Oh, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Up until 1966, um, I got married in 53. My, my first child was born, I got married in 52. My first child was born in 53. My second child was born in 56. And then I had a third pregnancy that I lost in 59. <clears throat> and so I, was, I worked here and I worked there, but mainly I was working at Newsday. And then in 1966, the, the reporter that I had this mad, mad crush on, she, uh, we were going to have lunch. And I normally didn't, you know, I went in kind of late, and then I'd work into the evening. And so she called me. We were going to have lunch about 12.30 or something. <clears throat> and she called me when I got into the art department, and she said, can't have lunch. I have to go interview some, I don't know, some, I don't know, they're doing some new women's group. I have to go to New York. And she was disgusted, because she didn't want to drive <laughs> into New York. Because this was on, in Garden City, Long Island. Uh -huh. oh, it was like 35, Forever. 40 miles. Sure. You know. So I said, all right. So she leaves, and about 6.30, the phone rings. And I'm in the art department, and, and she goes, hi, I'm back. I said, oh, good. She said, uh, we can have dinner if you want, but get in here right now. So I said, okay. So I hung up and go running into the city room, and, and I go over to, and she's typing madly. And she thrusts this paper at me, you know, kind of like, here, sign this. You know, and I said, what is it? She said, don't even ask me now, just sign it. And I, and I did. I mean, I would have given a five, my firstborn. You want my, <laughs> my, my, yeah, you can have that house, too. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. I, mean, I just adored her. So I signed this paper, and I went back, back to work. And later, she calls, and she said, OK, let's have dinner. So I said to her, what did I sign? She said, you joined the National Organization for Women. Huh. It, it was a membership form. Uh -huh. She said, that's what I went in to interview. It's a woman by the name of Betty Friedan. She wrote this book, Feminine, Mis Feminine Mystique, and they announced this formation of, of this new organization. And you just joined it. <laughs> I said, fabulous. And I thought, what? You know, because I hadn't read the book. And as, you know, as it turned out, that moment that I signed that paper was about to change my, my life in just about the most the most, every facet of my life changed. Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl, and I'm really honored to have been asked to speak here about the wonderful Ivy Bottini, uh, in part for many dykes who are not speaking here today, um, some who are no longer with us, like uh, O'Leary and Cordova and Midge, and some who thankfully are still with us, like Tori Osborne. Um, you know, anybody who makes it into their 10th decade should just hope that they could build half as wonderful and important a life as Ivy Bettini did just by living hers thoroughly. Uh, I think I met her maybe 40 years ago, uh, in the early 80s, an activism in the LGBTQ movement, but she already had laid down quite a history from early feminism. I mean, uh, the, the founder of the New York chapter of now, uh, you know, as an artist, uh, not just a, a uh, performing, but also a graphic artist, designed the now logo uh, and probably the banner that was thrown over the Statue of Liberty, uh, Women of the World Unite, because I know Ivy was uh, included in that group. Um, you know, she was a fierce feminist from the beginning uh, and insisted that lesbianism was a really fundamental part of feminism. And that was not a very popular point of view. As a matter of fact, 
when all the dykes were thrown out of now, uh, Ivy was one of them, but went on to insist that feminism and lesbianism and LGBTQ rights all were part of a fabric and uh, took a lot of leadership, moved to L.A. in 71, uh, uniting again feminism and LGBTQ work uh, in West Hollywood and L.A. through all the years, uh, pushing for treatment for AIDS, for recognition of AIDS and our community, organizing and fighting for every inch of our rights. Um, incredibly active, loved activism and activists. She just loved real people standing up for their rights and pushed them to do so and really inspired them to do so. At every rally, on every flatbed truck, on every intersection with a bullhorn. I mean, she just exhorted us to stand up and fight. And mostly I remember her really wicked sense of humor, those flashing eyes. You knew when she had made a joke, but she let you laugh first. Um, and such a kind heart, a kind, kind heart, uh, a great combination a great life of 94 years. I won't say Ivy rest in peace because she's probably organizing somewhere else and speechifying and just inspiring wherever and whatever. I'm so glad, so glad to have known her. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Love is a lesbian activist, writer, and editor. Her activism ranged from demonstrations against the New York Times that successfully forced integration of the want ads. Remember those want ads? Jobs for men, jobs for women. To being part of the presentation to the American Psychiatric Association that led to the removal of homosexuality from the list of mental disorders in the diagnostic manual. Here's Barbara. I knew Ivy from late 1967 to 19. 71 when she left New York to go to California. I was her friend. She was also my hero. Um, I remember before she became president, there were rumors, everybody kind of hush hush about lesbians in New York now. And they wanted somebody to represent now at a conference, uh, an event. And they chose Ivy because she was married with children living in the suburbs and did not fit the stereotype of a lesbian. So she was safe, <laughs> they thought. She became president and uh, she worked on all the issues uh, that Mal was interested in. Everybody liked her, except when they found out she might be a lesbian. But that was later on. She and Dolores Alexander were good friends, and Dolores wasn't a lesbian, but they were accusing her too, and sent the whole national office to Chicago to get rid of the lesbians, but it, it didn't work. I got wind that they, that they weren't, that the powers that be did not want Ivy, now they knew she was a lesbian, to be renewed as the ne next president the second term president. And uh, I called her, I remember it well, because she was working on the 1970 March that was so famous, where Gloria Steinem did her first speaking engagement. And Ivy was working on it with Jackie Ceballos and some others. And I called her and I said, Ivy, they're after you. They don't want you to be a second term president. And that the powers that be, the top leadership and now, which is very homophobic, uh, was working against you. She said, no, I feel very safe. I believe the members in the membership and they like me and I'm not worried. The, the time came and the membership was probably for her, but there was a, a big effort to get new members in the night of the election. You could still become a member the night of the election. There was a huge pile of people becoming members and they were given a second slate 
which did not have any lesbians or lesbian sympathizers on it. But it was a double the size, a triple the size of a normal meeting. And uh, so the people were rather confused. They were given a slate, and that was not the slate that was originally planned. And they were kind of whispers going around uh, as to who was a lesbian and who wasn't. And Ivy lost that vote by very few, uh, very few votes, five or six, I think. And that was a big shock to Ivy and all of her supporters and friends. And I remember that night. They call it the lesbian purge. And that shook up everybody across the country. Word got around very quickly about it, and uh, now became very paranoid about lesbians for a few years. I don't think they got over it until '73 or '75, even. But Ivy, of course, left the election where she lost was in January '71. She left soon after that be with her friends in California, where she did a lot of wonderful good things. But I know that she got a big ovation at the National Convention in 1971 in November, when now passed the resolution making lesbianism a feminist issue. And that was, Ivy really started that and got, and got the, uh, California group, particularly Arlie Scott, involved in writing this resolution. And when Ivy got to the convention, she got a big ovation. She was a hero. She was kind of surprised because she wasn't an egotistical person at all. She was just a, you know, matter of fact, do it. And, uh, but as I say, I, so she got things started and got people awakened to the issues and was definitely responsible for what went on in, in the rest of now. And, and then in the women's movement in general, I, I thought Ivy was absolutely wonderful and uh, a hero to every lesbian in the country. Virginia Carter is a physicist and a second wave feminist who was president of the National Organization for Women, Los Angeles chapter. As an entertainment executive, her experience has ranged from being director of creative affairs for Norman Lear to being president of a synthetic Ruby company. Welcome, Virginia. I loved Ivy. And I met her a long time ago. And it was, I think if I'm remembering correctly, we met at a restaurant in Manhattan called Mother Courage. And it was a place where women tended to gather and just pour their hearts out about whatever moved them or was troubling them or was thrilling them. So it became just wonderful to have the release of being with interesting, strong, smart other women. We, we found we could express the, the moods that moved us and encounter other people, friendly and smart and female, who had exactly the same feelings. And we began to do meetings of that kind as frequently as we could build them into our lives. And um, Ivy was, of course, the leader of this effort. I don't know if she was just the most self-confident person it was possible to come by. You know, I. I'm happy to be diplomatic. Ivy was happy to get it out there and then get the discussion going and then figure out what we were going to do about it. She said what she had on her mind by God. And she often said it so that people were okay with it. 
you know, a lot of a lot of the trouble we sometimes have is that we don't step up to the problem. We sort of circumnavigate it and try to be diplomatic about it. And Ivy just said it the way it was. Eventually, Ivy decided, for whatever reason, and I don't know what the reason was, to come to Los Angeles. And she started then uh, the kinds of meetings we'd been having in Manhattan uh, to discuss our troubles. Consciousness raising groups is what we call them. I think we call them that. I discovered with amazement and delight how Ivy was able to, <clears throat> able to just open up and say it, whatever it was. And it, it did a lot. Um, for those who were expected to behave in a civil way in response to Ivy's openness. But it also struck me at the time that Ivy didn't really care whether you were a polite, modest, uh, diplomatic human being. She really didn't care. She liked everybody. It didn't really matter. For her, it seems now in retrospect, as I look back through the years and all the other people I've met in contrast to Ivy, it seemed that she was, that her, her essential characteristic was that she loved everybody. She, they could be good, bad, or indifferent as long as they were in her range. <laughs> she could find ways to add to their, to add to the quality of their lives. That's what she gave. And some people would have thought it was presumptuous, but I don't think Ivy really cared much about what people thought about these things. She simply did what she did and she did what she thought was right. And what she thought was right gives us all pause for thought because she liked everybody, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. That's Ivy's gang. And um, it's a lesson that I've tried to hold in my heart and I'm proud of what I've managed, but it is in some very significant part due to the fact that Ivy was a friend of mine. And that's what I want you to know. I call this day in the life of a pregnant woman. You see a lot of ceilings. kid I don't mind the elbow and I don't mind the crawling but when you give me the finger Taking your contacts out. As a woman, there's a way. <laughs>
numerous presidential campaigns from Jean McCarthy to Bill Clinton, from anti-Vietnam War demonstrations all over the country and internationally, to being a founding member of MECLA, the Municipal Elections Committee of Los Angeles, from the No on Six campaign with Ivy Bottini, to the Great Peace March for Nuclear Global Disarmament, from AIDS activism to best-selling author, David Mixer is a legend in the LGBT community. Thank you for being here today, David. Hello, this is David Mixner, and I am so pleased to be able to have, take a few minutes and honor Ivory Bottini, who was a dear friend, a mentor, and someone who I love dearly. Ivy and I have worked together since 1976, 77. Uh, when Anita Bryant had won in Florida, then went on to win in St. Paul and Wichita and Eugene, of course, they came to California and with the Briggs Initiative, Proposition 6. Initially, what most people don't remember, uh, a lot of people in the community were so terrified that if we oppose the initiative, she will surely win and that would just increase her power and that we should not spend any money, not oppose it. Well, that was just not acceptable to a group of us, a small group of us, including Ivy Bottini, Pat Denslow, Peter Scott, myself, Diane Abbott, Roberta Bennett, and Troy Perry. And no one wanted to give us any money. They thought it was a uh, Don Quixote type calls. And uh, Ivy believed passionately that you had to fight any injustice, no matter what the odds. And we created an organization called New Age, New Alliance for Gay and Lesbian Equality. And we worked hard, led to the campaign. She headed up the grassroots effort statewide. And she was magnificent. She was a born organizer. Uh, her cackle, her laugh, her uh, uh, inviting presence. Uh, made her the perfect person uh, to go around the state and speak and bring people into the calls. She had this marvelous sense of humor, this mischievous smile. I knew I was in for a little uh, teasing when she got that smile, but she also was tough as nails. And I say that in the best way. She wouldn't tolerate bullshit. She wouldn't tolerate women being treated less in the campaign. She understood that we had come a long way from the 1950s, but there still was misogyny in the gay male community. We went on and worked in the uh, uh, No on LaRouche initiative in 1986, run by Tori Osborne. And Ivy was in charge again of all grassroots activity in California. And by this time, she was a pro at campaigns. She wasn't really that much of a political, political figure as she was a extraordinary organizer. As I used to tell Ivy, I said, Ivy, you're the female Saul Alinsky. You know more about organizing at the grassroots than almost anyone I know. I loved her. I respected her. I adored her. She was a remarkable woman, a remarkable person. She loved every human being, but she would take no nonsense from any human being. And that's what it's about. A movement is willing to include people, but not to indulge in their uh, effort to seek consensus to the lowest possible political denominator. Ivy, I was honored to be your friend. I am honored to be here today. I look forward to seeing you soon, not too soon, but I look forward to seeing you and we'll create hell in heaven. You take care, I love you. Well, another legend in the LGBT community is Phil Wilson, the founder of the Black AIDS Institute. His activism, however, started long before then, most visibly when he read the poem, Where Will You Be When They Come? at a candlelight vigil for people with AIDS. Phil worked as the Director of Policy and Planning at AIDS Project Los Angeles as the AIDS coordinator for the city of Los Angeles, as the co-chair of the Los Angeles HIV Health Commission on the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS during the Obama administration, 
and as a World AIDS Summit delegate. Welcome, Phil. What do you do? Where do you start? What do you say when the lioness has fallen? How do you pay tribute to Ivy Bettini? If Morse Kite and or Don Kill Hefner were the fathers of the Los Angeles gay and lesbian bi community, then Ivy was clearly the mother. I wonder what she would say about that characterization. She would probably say, stop the sexist bullshit, Phil. I was the founder or one of the founders of this movement. And so she was. When I arrived in Los Angeles in 1982 as a young black gay man, um, Ivy was everywhere. No matter what you wanted to do, no, someone would eventually consult with Ivy. She was our community activist. She was our organizer. She was you know, our drum major. She was our drill sergeant. She was our big thinker and she was the one who focused on details. She was the stage manager of our movement. When I think of Ivy today, I think of my three favorite poets. Essex Hemphill asks, I want to start an organization to save my life. If whales, snails, Chrysler, and, Crip and, and Nixon can be saved, he believed that our community was valuable and worthy of saving, and so did Ivy. Audre Lorde said, when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we are silent, we're still afraid. Ivy was always there to speak for us, and to make sure our voices were heard. The great Pat Parker said, where will you be when they come? And they came, they came often and they came for us. And Ivy was always there on the front line. And for that, we will always be grateful. For that, she will never be forgotten. Ivy, why do we need special lesbian and gay elder housing? Because uh, we, um, elder lesbian and gay people, um, over the years have tried to go to other retirement homes, um, to be, you know, to go to uh, convalescent homes, and the treatment that we receive is horrific. Uh, for instance, if you have a partner and you go to uh, some of the retirement homes, you cannot be in the same room together. Plus. Mm -hmm. If when you go in, let's say you go in by yourself, you have to go back in the closet because of the abuse that is heaped upon you. There, there's a man in my church, I go to a church in Long Beach and his name is Jim and he has Parkinson's disease and it required that he be in a convalescent home, mm -hmm. you know, several times. Mm -hmm. And the abuse that he was faced with was in, inhuman, they would, people, you know, part of the staff, they would stand just outside his door and talk about fags and homos and sickness. And this is, you know, the first generation that I have people in my life who I could refer to as my parent. Mm -hmm. This is my lesbian mother here. As to a lot of people in our community, she is. I think to our community. To our community, she certainly is. And... You know, these are the people that walk the streets, that were experienced Stonewall, that marched for us, that changed the landscape of this country for our community, that we can benefit, we benefit from what they did for us. Mm -hmm. This is the time that we need to stand up and honor them mm -hmm. and provide safe, comfortable, dignified, uh, There's the word, dignified and, and joyous. Dignity. And exactly. joyous. As you get older, uh, it's very important to remain active because it keeps your spirits up. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it's mental exercise. Mm -hmm. um, you become a more interesting person when you're participating. I've worked on this issue off and on mm -hmm. for now 23 years. For decades. And it's... You know, I guess I saw so much um, pain in our community, in, in people who had places to live, and in, in young people, and in middle-aged people, and, and, then I, and then AIDS started, mm -hmm. and there was no place for us to go. I mean, 
AIDS people were being kicked out of where they lived. And I, I, I just felt somehow as, as we grow older, we've got to have a place. And, you know, the lesbian community, um, a lot of the older lesbians, you know, now we see professional, professional, not professional, lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> what is a professional, professional women? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> professional women. <laughs> professional women who are lesbians. Uh -huh. And we see uh, the, 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 um, the lesbians who have good jobs and who have money. But what, what we don't really see in the community a lot are the older lesbians who, when they were coming up and they were growing, they couldn't get those kind of jobs because they didn't look like the professional people. They got the service jobs, and they got jobs driving a truck, and they, they got jobs in packing houses, mm -hmm. and there were no benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And many of them worked under the table mm -hmm. so that they could get a job. So that they could make ends meet also. Yes, and these are the women, a lot of the women, who really have nothing to fall back on. This development is for people who have nothing to fall back on. Andy Sacker has gone from a widely varied career that began as a concept architect and exhibit designer at Disney Imagineering to curating educational exhibits and producing themed entertainment for Steven Spielberg's GameWorks to being the founding executive and creative director at The Lavender Effect, a project with a mission of advancing the future of LGBT heritage and culture through a variety of strategies, including education. Andy? Hello, my name is Andy Socker and Ivy Botini was my mentor. I have many things to thank Ivy for. I wish I had a chance to tell her in person, but I thought I'd share all the things I'm thankful for with you. I want to thank Ivy for devoting over 50 years of her life to the women's and LGBT movements. I can't see either movement without her, and she was a force to be reckoned with. I want to thank her for co-founding the first chapter of the National Organization for Women, showing women that they can do anything they want in life for perhaps the first time for taking over the Statue of Liberty to hang a large Women of the World Unite banner, for performing your one woman show, The Many Faces of Women, and spearheading the fight to defeat the Briggs Initiative, which for those that don't know, would have banned gays and lesbians from teaching in LA's public schools. Oh, for organizing numerous gay rights marches and die-ins, especially during the 1980s, um, for fighting to get services to the sick and dying during the AIDS epidemic, for chairing the No on, La no on LaRouche and No on 64 victories, for encouraging lesbians and gay men to work together uh, to help the sick and the dying, for founding the AIDS Network LA and co-founding APLA, for founding uh, or co-chairing the West Hollywood Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board, and for founding the Los Angeles Lesbian Gay Police Advisory Board for spearheading work on partner abuse and crystal meth addiction, and being a huge champion for affordable housing for LGBT seniors. I'm also very grateful that you were a founding advisor to the Lavender Effect and showing all of us what an activist is by doing. 
Ivy, rest in pride, knowing that your legacy will live on in all of us. And one of the most amazing things that came out of that whole experience, all, that, all those years of death and dying and confusion and fear and uh, bias and uh, how that outer world Margin, you know, marginalized us, and we, our community, just came together like some force of nature, just brought us together, and, and we became like one. And our, our mission, we didn't talk about it, but we were all set on taking care of each other. It was organic. And it was amazing and uh, to, to go through that was, it saved so many, it saved so many people because they knew that they weren't alone. They weren't alone. And if, if they were sick, there was someone who went to them and took care of them. And, and in the meantime, we're all fighting these propositions that they have coming at us, a lot of them. And where uh, LaRouche is trying to put us in these con like concentration camps, not the women, but the men. And, and it was, God, if America could come together like we did, what a world it could be. Just before we heard from Andy Socker, uh, we heard Ivy talking about gay and lesbian elder housing. And I wanted to make everyone aware, if you weren't already aware, that Ivy was one of the three signatories that brought gay and lesbian elder housing into being. So I just wanted to say that. Um, Marcy Vaj has been a quiet, soothing presence in our community for decades. Her professional accomplishments as a violinist and a violist include serving as concertmaster for the San Diego Chamber Orchestra to being a soloist in at least a dozen concerts in Paris. But that's Paris, France, not, not the Paris uh, up the highway here in California. She has hundreds of film credits. She teaches, she composes, she manages orchestra personnel. The list is endless, but from my personal point of view, she's a person who is always there, always shows up when she gets the call. I have never asked Marcy to play at an event and had her say, no, that's just who she is. And today is no exception. Thank you, Marcy. And now here's a wonderful world.
Yeah, I paused deliberately for a few seconds because that was kind of a showstopper. Randy Espenside is someone who's been in sales most of his career, including uh, at the Gay Yellow Pages. Uh, and uh, as a salesperson professionally, uh, it was a natural to be drawn to Ivy and connect with her who loved him. Ivy loved him so much. Uh, in his younger days, Randy was an Olympic level competitive swimmer. Um, so we're really eager to hear from uh, Randy. I'm Randy Espenshai, and I started working with Ivy Bottini at the Community Yellow Pages in 1994 with Jean Cordova in Hollywood. That's how I met Ivy. I had never met Ivy before. I didn't know Ivy. I didn't know anything about Ivy. But we worked with Jean, so we would work together for six years, have lunch every day, and became the best of friends. And if I had anything to say about Ivy, it's just she... We spent all of our time over food, hundreds and hundreds of lunches and dinners, and uh, she's my best friend. I learned everything I needed to know about Ivy through all that time with her. I knew better than to talk politics with her. She came over here in 2000 for her birthday, and I said something political, and she put me back in my place, and said, she called me an ignorant something or another, but I knew never to talk to Ivy about politics. As a matter of fact, any time I had a vote, I would... Just get my ballot, call Ivy up and say, hey, Ivy, who do I vote for? Did I cheat? Yeah, but I cheated from the best. And I uh, I miss her. I loved her more than life itself. And I'm going to miss her. Bye, Ivy. I love you, honey. I love you too, Randy. Uh, bye for now or bye, love. And oftentimes I would say to Ivy, Ivy, I love you more than life itself. And Ivy would just look at me and she said, love, life. And she lived a long, productive life. And she was my rock, not just for me, but probably anybody that ever met her. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say for right now. I, I miss her. I loved her. And she was funny. And we laughed. And we laughed. And we just lived life uh, in the moment and shared all of our mutual experiences. So there's just so much to talk about Ivy, but a lot of that is stuff that is just part of life, the fabric. So anyway, love you, Ivy. I miss you. I pray for you every night and I know where you are right now. Love you, Ivy. Randy and Ivy has one great love relationship and, and just so heartfelt. Uh, Elaine Serrani is an activist, lecturer, writer, teacher, filmmaker, and a respiratory therapist by training, who was only 10 years old when she first read about Ivy Bottini in the Los Angeles Times. Obviously, the lesson took, and Elaine eventually came to be very close with Ivy, and she really, as the saying goes, put her money where her mouth was in her financial support and opposition uh, to Proposition 8, the anti-gay marriage campaign. So here's Elaine. So my name is Elaine Serrani, and Ivy and I go back into the um, early and mid-90s. So we've known each other for a very long time and we became friends right away. We hit it off as soon as we met each other. Um, when we had both been asked to speak on a APLA panel on ageism. And I was at the 30 something end of the table and she was at the 60 something end of the table. And we couldn't actually see each other. She's so damn short. Um, but I liked what she was saying and, and she liked what I was saying. And afterwards I went over and I met her and um, and asked her if she wanted to go to lunch, I'd like to pick her brain. And she said, sure, kid, you know, type of thing. And um, that was it. I mean, we were buddies from then on out. We laughed nonstop. We just had so much fun together. Um, great sense of humor. Um, just get toe to toe on issues together. It was so much fun. It, Ivy was not an icon to me. Ivy was just a shit kicker to me that I liked, so we had a ball. 
And in 2006, I was appointed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to the California Commission on the Status of Women. When uh, we sat on, the, you know, this big dais in, at the state capitol, and you know, high back leather chairs, microphones, and stuff, and and came around to me, um, and the secretary asks if I if there was anything I would like to speak about. And I said, yes. I said, I was wondering, could I get some time on the calendar? And I said, I would like to do a public hearing on the status of lesbians in California. And there was stone cold silence on the whole commission. And so I was able to pull together some amazing people. And Ivy was one of them, I pulled her in. The night before the hearing, Ivy had come up there with me and we were in a hotel room together across the street from the state capitol and somebody had sent her a note, one of these women's groups, and I don't remember who it was, and they had sent her a Bible verse and looked it up and I said to her, I read it to her, he has told thee what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And I look over to Ivy and she's sitting there on the bed and she goes, hmm. She goes, well, two out of three is not bad. <laughs> and we laughed about that for 10 minutes. And basically, anybody who is as dynamic of a human being and an activist of any kind in any area like Ivy, they're not humble you know, because their entire platform is to get attention for their cause, which always looks like them. That's what an activist does. She was willing to forego that. She didn't care because she cared so much more about what, what she could get accomplished. And, um, you know, the best part of being her friend was just how her mind worked, just the, the ideas. That's, that was who she was. She was my friend. I love her dearly. I will never forget her. She is the most dynamic person, complex, complicated, love her, hate her. And I had both of those moments and we just, pulled it out, man. It was, it was great. It was a great, great friendship. And, um, I will never forget her. She was something special. They don't come around like that very often. We were very, very lucky to have her. Lesbian, 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 lesbian. Lesbian, 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 lesbian. Lesbian! lesbian! Some, some women they don't like the word lesbian because it's too harsh. It's too confrontational. It's historic. It has a lineage. It's part of our tribe. It's a fabulous word. If you are afraid to be called a lesbian, somebody says, what are you, a lesbian? You want to do that? Then you will, you will never be free until you can say, yes, I am. And, and that means whether you are or not, whether you are or not a lesbian, if you can say, yes, I am, you're free. Rita Gonzalez is a longtime political activist and journalist, and has long been a radio journalist as well for IMRU on KPFK. And I can tell you from personal experience, she's an effective and very patient teacher as well. Rita? An egg timer and a cane. What can these two items possibly have in common? Well, for me, it's Ivy Patini. Ivy was my friend and my mentor. We go back over 30 years or so. Whenever she saw me, any event or wherever, she always treated me with such warmth. She was an activist and so much more. She was also a very talented entertainer and artist. 
And I love that about her. When the city of West Hollywood was gonna dedicate a tree in her honor, Ivy asked me to be one of the speakers and she was very specific. She said, I only had three minutes. And since it was Ivy, I was not gonna go over that. Enter the egg timer. I actually brought it with me to the event and Ivy just burst out laughing. As for the cane, it is a cherished reminder of the last time we spent together in person. I had gone to Florida to visit with her. And while I was there, I was having trouble with my knee. And uh, she offered me one of her canes. And I asked her to sign it because she never had a chance to uh, autograph her book for me. Well, last November, she called me. And the first thing out of her mouth is, do you have that cane? And I said, yes, Ivy. It rests right next to my computer. So I always think about you. Well, this last November, we had some great conversations on Zoom and on the telephone, just talking about nonsense sometimes. And she even laughed about that. She said, I can't believe we're talking about dumb things. I said, yeah, but it's fun. Ivy was bigger than life. And she will always be in my heart. I'm going to miss you, my friend. Thank you, Rita. Karina Samala is a transgender community advocate and human rights activist. She's campaigned for equality and human rights for transgender individuals for decades. She's currently the chair of the Los Angeles City Transgender Advisory Council. She was also the founding chair of the City of West Hollywood Transgender Advisory Board. She's inspired an entire generation of transgender individuals with her tireless work on their behalf such that She's earned the affectionate nickname of Mama Karina. I met Ivy way back in 2016 when she was just awarded by Sheila, uh, Supervisor Sheila Q on the Woman of the Year Award 2016. We were having a difficulty at the time. I was in the board of CSW LA Pride and the new leadership was trying to get rid of a transgender Friday night event, with I, which I started. This event is for our community, to be there for our community, and we have a transgender stage. I came to the community and asked our community to be there at the board meeting because it's open to the public. I was introduced to Ivy by Sue Sexton, one of the board members and I thank her for that. Unfortunately, at that board meeting, Ivy wasn't able to make it inside the board meeting itself. We had our board meeting at the Pacific Science Center, and on her way there, she fell and broke her ankle. The following day, I went to visit her at the hospital. <clears throat> we had some talk, and she was really very much, I'm very much appreciative of what the support and help that she had for our community. Ivy has been a leader of the gay and, of the gay and lesbian causes for over 50 years, I believe it's almost like 60 years. And with that said, she's always been for their rights, the gay, lesbian rights movement. She was involved with the NOW also, the NOW movement for women, NOW organization for women, and very active in helping the community. At the time, our community, the transgender community, is just starting, and we need a lot of support and help, and I thank her for that, for being there to help us with that. We owe her a great deal of her activism, and I look upon her as a guidance also. And the next, the last time I saw her was when she was awarded by the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, where she had received her sainthood from the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. She's a, an, an icon and really 
a mentor for all of us who's starting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Corinna. Judith Bransberg is a professor emeritus at Pasadena City College, where she taught nonfiction writing, women's studies, gay and lesbian studies, and American literature. She's also the author of The Liberation of Ivy Bottini, a memoir of love and activism. Let's all crash the Amazon website today, okay? Everybody go to Amazon and buy about five copies of the book. You're on, Judith. During lunch with Ivy, Lynn Ballen, and Jean Cordova at the 2014 Veteran Feminists of America Conference in Los Angeles, Ivy, then 87 years old, mentioned she wanted to write her memoir, but she wasn't a writer. I didn't know her well, but I admired her. I had just finished another writing project, so I offered to help. That's how my intense, enriching, all too few years friendship with Ivy began. Over the next five years or so, Ivy and I worked together on her memoir, sitting at the dining room table in her bright condo on Kings Road in West Hollywood. I always remember it being warm and sunny during our sessions, but I'm sure that could not have been true, even in sunny Southern California. There was just something about Ivy that made it feel that way. Often before we began, we have to clear the table of the clutter of papers and articles having to do with one or two of Ivy's ongoing campaigns. As most of you know, there was always a cause for Ivy to take up. She never stopped being an activist, pretty much to the end of her days. In the early days of our work, trying to assemble and make sense of the pieces of her life, and later when my partner Amy and I spent many afternoons reading aloud portions of the text for Ivy's review, there are always more stories, way more than could be included in any reasonably length memoir. Her memory was phenomenal. As she reminisced, she was funny, solemn, sad, and proud. There were tales filled with the soon to be famous and the not famous, stories of family, loss, breakdowns of jobs, mentors, and teachers, of coming out, sex, heartbreak, and love, not necessarily in that order of art and performances, of prizes, of winning and losing campaigns, of personal and political victories and challenges. The range of her talents and interests and experiences astounded me. I came to admire her more than I can say. Most of all, I'm personally grateful to Ivy for all those afternoons and for opening up her life and history to me. But on a larger scale, what I tried to convey in the memoir the liberation of Ivy Bettini was the warm, extraordinarily complex, multi-talented woman whose driving force was an unwavering dedication to help all women, as well as gay and trans people, live full lives. No matter her own personal demons or political conflicts and disappointments, financial issues and physical challenges, she kept to that commitment. I'm forever thankful to Ivy for giving me the opportunity to speak to who she was in her memoir and to share with a wider world why we were all thankful for the life she lived. You know, people like uh, Caroline Heldman have CVs, not resumes. You know, resumes are a page or two long, whereas a CV, a curriculum vitae, uh, has many pages and hers is endless. So I'm sorry that Today, in the interest of time, I can only tell you that she's a professor at Occidental College, a frequently published writer in both professional journals and popular magazines like Ms. Um, she's the executive director of the Representation Project. And if you don't know her work, go online and watch the numerous interviews with her. It's pretty amazing. Here comes Car Professor Heldman. Hello, my name is Caroline Heldman, and I co-chaired with the late, great Ivy Bottini the efforts in California to abolish the time limit for prosecuting rape and sexual assault. I first met Ivy Bottini through her radio show on KPFK, uh, where I was called in to do an interview, and she was simply incredible. I knew we were going to be fast, lifelong friends, and indeed we have been. Uh, Ivy contacted me, left a message on my work line saying, hey, I've had it with this time limit on prosecuting rape in California. 
Um, I'm livid. I want to organize a campaign. You want to run this thing with me. And indeed, we joined forces. We organized and met uh, over uh, at the park that now bears a tree in her honor. Um, we went to Sacramento and lobbied the state legislature in order to write this law. Uh, we worked with various folks to organize campaigns and protests and letter writing campaigns and phone calling campaigns to put pressure on the policy process at every point, at every stage to make sure that this law got passed. And Ivy was the leader, the driver of this. Uh, she organized a rally on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, uh, really centering around Bill Cosby's star because Lily Bernard, uh, a very vocal Bill Cosby survivor, also worked incredibly hard on this campaign. And Ivy stood up and grabbed the bullhorn and led the forces that day to overturn the time limit for prosecuting rape and sexual assault in California. She was the absolute engine, the energy, the sage, the guide, the wise woman, and we will miss her tremendously. Uh, I have never worked with someone who is more focused and more determined to shift something that has always been. And I think that was you know, Ivy's brilliance of really being able to imagine the world in a way that is different from what it is, from what people accept, from what is commonplace, and grabbing a hold of that new idea that she has in her head of how the world can be, and just sinking her teeth into it and not letting go. Um, Ivy, you are someone who had true grit. Well, does Dottie Wine really need any invitation? Any invitation, she already been invited. Any introduction? Okay, it's getting late. Um, friends and family and fans of Ivy Bottini know Dottie has been Ivy's friend, her, her life partner, her muse, her supporter, her biggest fan, her fiercest staunch defender, protector, spokeswoman, and guardian of what is now Ivy's legacy, which couldn't be in better, safer, or more reliable hands. And here's Dottie. Wow, Ivy Bettini, how do you talk about knowing a person of Ivy's dynamic qualities, knowing her almost 46 years in a few short minutes? You've heard many people talk today about Ivy, how they knew her, the impact she made on their lives. There's lots of, um, the public part of Ivy is well documented and archived and has been widely shared and will continue to be. I'm going to share some of the more personal things that endeared Ivy to me. Ivy and I lived together as a couple for several years and we went our separate ways for a few. And then we had a long on again, off again friendship relationship over the next few years with lots of fun, laughter, tears, adventure. Did you know that Ivy was a very private person? She sometimes had a hard time, even though she appreciated them, with all the accolades and honors and awards that were bestowed upon her for her good work. She would like to come home, take off her shoes, put up her feet, turn on the television, and just space out with not one responsibility on her plate. That's how she rejuvenated for the next project that might come along. And something else that I really admired about Ivy was that she was not possessive about her ideas or her projects. She would see a need. She would share it with a few people. Hopefully they'd get on board and become leaders. And together they would recruit more people and decide on a strategy. They would coalesce, they'd collaborate, whatever was required to make the next step happen. And often when she would see that a project was moving along, sort of having a life of its own, she would bow out and she would go get ready for her next project that whatever came across her radar. She was not possessive of her, her, um, her projects. She just wanted to make sure that something that was not right got changed. An additional thing that I really valued about Ivy was her ability to overcome obstacles. As she began to lose her eyesight and had to give up painting the way she wanted to and all of driving she just kept moving on. 
Creating art is quite challenging with impaired sight, but not impaired vision. I said at one point, I admire you. Your sight changes and you just change your method of painting and you keep on going. And she said, I don't think I have a choice. To which I responded, you do have a choice. I don't think you give yourself enough credit. Many people under those circumstances would have figuratively stuck their thumb in their mouth, crawled up on the couch, pulled up their feet, and that would have been it. But not Ivy. Ivy just kept finding another way to move ahead. She moved her painting style from portraiture to big flowers, to big woman's bodies, to geometrics, and eventually to poured painting as her eyesight continued to deteriorate. To be an artist and not see well was indeed challenging, but Ivy did not let that stop her. I think that mindset symbolizes and summarizes how Ivy approached life and her many lasting projects, sort of like the principle she learned in art school many years ago. Put the pencil down, know where you want to go, and go there. It truly was an undergirding and guiding point in her art and her life. I miss her. I will always love her. My life was dramatically impacted and changed by knowing the many faces of Ivy Bottini. And now, let us hear from Ivy Bottini. I wanted to do this song because it has a lot of meaning way back when we were in the closet and didn't know what to do or afraid to come out. But we knew there had to be something better. And so I, today, I just want to leave you with this song and um, know how much it has bolstered me. 50 years, a long time. could be longer, I guess. <laughs> I've lost count. So, strike up the band.
ask, uh, hello, I'd like to ask uh, everyone, wherever you are in the country or the world, put your hands together for our astonishing tech team. This was not an easy feat to put this together. So all of you. Okay, wow. Well, we have come to the end of the first part of our two hour celebration of the life of Ivy Bottini. And this is where I sign off as MC and turn hosting duties over to Ivy's vagina. <laughs> oh, wait, what? Wait, I have notes. Um, oh, um, well, actually, Karen Ayers played the role of Ivy's vagina uh, in Ivy's vagina monologue show. Uh, is that better? I hope. Never mind. Forget about it. Moving right along, Karen is an activist, a West Hollywood City Commissioner, and part of the amazing tech team that buoyed us through all of this process. Here's Karen Ayers. Thank you, Terry. Hi. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm honored to be part of the women who organized this important event. And we wanted to dedicate a part of this time for people who um, would like to share a story about Ivy. And here's how it's going to work. We are going to, well, One Archives is gonna help me um, identify the people who would like to speak. And what, I'll call it your name and you'll have two minutes to tell a story. And at, thir at the 30 minute mark, I'm gonna hold up a sign. Actually, I'm, gonna, I'm going to turn off my, um, virtual background because it'll be easier to see. Okay, so at, at uh, 30 seconds, I will hold up a sign. And at 15 seconds, I'll hold up this sign. And at the two minute mark, I will hold up this sign. That way, um, you could just keep an eye on my screen and, uh, and keep track of how much time you have left. And I believe our first speaker tonight is going to be Lynn. So if we can have Lynn um, unmuted. Okay, let's, let's check this again. Can we get Lynn unmuted and her screen on. Um, Lynn will have to, so I just unmuted you, but you have to also hit unmute on your own screen in order to finish the process of, of unmuting. So Lynn didn't have a question, turns out. Oh, okay. Let's see. Um, let's see. David Stern, did you want to speak? Yo, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, everybody. What, what a beautiful tribute, and thank you all for doing this. Um, I own Frontiers uh, magazine from and the Yellow Pages from 2007 and around 2014. And when I started working there, Ivy was gone. And she came back and approached us and wanted to come back to work at the Yellow Pages. And we opened, welcomed her with open arms. She went legally blind while she was working for us. And she still wanted to work. And her daughter, Lala, came on board and worked with her side by side. And I got to watch the beauty of that mother, mother and daughter team for a couple of years and hear Ivy's stories at lunch and let her do live woman, one man, one, one woman shows in my office sometimes. It was incredible. Um, I'm a writer and I don't know how to express myself. Uh, the best way I do is through, through poem or lyrics. And something came to me right before this. I will read it quickly. I have not even read this myself. It just kind of flew out of my hand. So here we go. Ivy was a driving force. She took a good life, good look at her life and changed her course and lived a life without remorse. She would, some would call her a hero, I know, as she stood strong carrying her activist bow being very aware that you reap what you sow and this is why her spirit grows. Ivy taught lessons in life so we all could grow. She guides our hand if we let her spirit show. Life on earth comes to an end we know, but that is the beginning, not the end of the show. 
Do you live your life trying to tie a noose or a bow and live by the creed you reap what you sow? Ivy did that she paved the way. So let's take a moment and find time to pray. I miss you, dear Ivy, till we meet again someday. You were loved here on earth each and every day. I know your spirit will come out to play as you watch over loved ones and random strays. On earth or in heaven, Ivy Botini still paves the way for those who listen and know how to pray with complete certainty that we will meet again someday. For this is one story of Ivy Botini told from me at 60 and Queenie. Her body is gone, but her spirit is free. And now it is a part of me. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you, David. Um, next, uh, Nadia Sutton, would you like to speak? We just need to um, unmute you and then you can unmute yourself. Nadia, I can see you in the room. I think you just have to click the unmute button. Mm -hmm. And there you go. Great. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, Avi, I was so, so lucky to have you as my mentor and as my dear friend for so many years. Uh, in 1989, when my friend and I, uh, my friend uh, Stan and I decided to have the crazy idea to start Pause LA, a nonprofit to uh, support our friends living with this, keep their pets. Many people said this was impossible. But Ivy, you said otherwise. And you, along with other people, cheered me on. You wrote superb articles for the LGBT press. You spoke eloquent, eloquently in front of city council for me. And you introduced me to many of our generous donors. And as you know, nobody said no to Ivy. But most important, you believed in me when others did not. I thank you so much. And I so, so appreciate you for always having my back. And I thank you for our wonderful conversations and for all the laughter we shared and all the good and bad trouble we got into. And mostly for all the laughter and joy we shared together. And I thank you for sharing with me all the good trouble we got into and the bad trouble. And Ivy, my darling, I promise you, I shall go and sit under your new tree at Crescent Heights and bring along a deliciously erotic lesbian novel and read it, eating chocolate truffles thinking of you. I love you, Ivy, and go and kick ass wherever you are. I love you. Thank you, Nadia. Um, next, we have Lester Aponte. Can we get Lester Aponte in the room and unmuted? And if there's a way to allow Lester to turn his camera on, that would be great too. But I'm not sure if that's possible in this format. Let's see. Lester, I think you should be able to unmute yourself and begin speaking now. Hi. Oh. Oh, uh, it is hard to uh, add much to what's been said about the extraordinary life of Ivy Bottini. Um, Ivy was one of the founders of the Stonewall Democratic Club uh, and president of the Stonewall Democratic Club, a responsibility that's fallen on me recently. Um, at the time when Ivy was one of the founders of our club, we lived in a very different uh, state. There were no elected officials who were openly LGBTQ and very few politicians who will take a meeting with a group that advocated for LGBTQ rights. Uh, Ivy understood the importance of electoral politics as much as she understood the importance of protesting and uh, being active out in the streets. 
in 2019, when Ivy was leaving the state, we invited her over to one of our meetings. Uh, we uh, gave her some flowers and a nice certificate. I read from one of her speeches to our club from the 1990s. Um, Ivy proceeded to scold us for not being out in the streets like she felt that we needed to be. Um, and that was a little jarring, but Ivy was never once to mince words. And she reminded us of our activists, activist roots. The work is not done. Our community is constantly under attack from regressive forces. There is an epidemic of attacks on our transgender uh, brothers and sisters. There was a murder just this week of Natalia Smut in San Jose. Um, we march also in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in other communities uh, with the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. We can't forget that even though we've made so much progress since Ivy first uh, went out there and proclaimed the importance of being open about who we are and fighting for our rights, that the work is not done. It need to continue to be troublemakers every single day. Thank you so much. We miss you, Ivy. Thank you, Lester. Um, next, we have Marianne Moore. If Marianne Moore could be added to the room and given permission to unmute and turn on her camera. You can go ahead, Marianne. Marianne, oh, you just need, oh, there you go. Here we are. Yeah. Okay, so this is Louise Moore for most of you, not, not Marianne. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, it's okay, nobody knows me, you know, on, on Zoom. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to tell the story. Marianne, you, you cut out for a minute. Oh, and... yeah, I see, I got... I got cut out. Okay, here we go. Looks like I'm back. Am I back? Yes. Yeah, here we go. Yes. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, many moons ago, I was the volunteer coordinator for the Mesa collection. And what I, I got connected with Ivy through Yolanda Ritter. And Yolanda Ritter and Ivy and Joan, Joan Cordova conned me in to joining them and, and they always would seduce you. I mean, they were just great at it. They would say, oh, come on, let's do this together. And we wanted the Mazer co Collection to join one institute. And I thought it was a good idea because even though I don't use it, I had a master's in art history and, you know, I think a library is a great institution and it continues forever. So I thought, yeah, you know, let's do that. So Lynn, I, I miss your lover so much because Cordova and Ivy were like the, the tag team. They were just, they would just keep people going, you know, and I was, I was the grassroots kid who they would say, oh, come on, let's just do this and let, tell me what to do and I would do it. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, the other people who were part of the Mesa collection at that time did not agree. So anyway, uh, but I love being part of that. And Yolanda went on and uh, had her own little room at, at one for a while, but Ivy and, and Cordova and Ritter, man, they were my triumph. They would keep me going. So I love you guys. I will miss Ivy forever. Take care. Thank you. Next we have um, Lynn. Lynn, would you like to um, be joined to the room? And we'll get you uh, unmuted. Hi, um, I think you can hear me, but I'm not seeing a camera option. Um, I think, 
I think you just hit start video. It'll be coming out in just a moment. She's promoted me to pen. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so thank you for including me. Um, I, yeah, what Louise was just saying and what many others have said about um, Jean Cordova, my late partner and Ivy is that they were troublemakers together and that went way back to the 70s. And what Ivy said about Jean at her memorial is that um, Jean was her best butch bud, but more than that, they were, they just had the same kind of political vision and they would see something that needed to be done. And as others have said, Ivy had this great understanding of you know, where there was an injustice, you organized, you brought a group together, you inspired people. And um, at the same time, she also had this ability to do it joyfully. Ivy had like a way of making people feel that they belonged to something larger than themselves. And that was something that was such a gift. Um, her humor, her art, her the many parts of her personality. Um, I really appreciate that everyone has talked about them today. But I thought of Ivy as family because when Jean and I got together in 89, Ivy was already Jean's family. And so I got Ivy with the package. Um, so Ivy was part of all of our important family events. And um, the funniest story I'll tell briefly is at Jean and my partnering, Ivy was the MC. But Ivy also came up to Jean and said, your mom's really cute and wanted to invite Jean's mom to dance at the partnering and got permission from Jean's dad to take Jean's mom around the floor. And that was a, a particular Ivy flirting memory that I wanted to share with everyone. Thanks. Thanks all for making this happen. Thank you. Whoa, got a little bit of a echo there. <laughs> um, next, we have Seppi Shine. Seppi, would you like to uh, have have an Ivy story with us? Yes. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone who put this beautiful, touching um, memorial and tribute together to Ivy. Um, you know, I, coming out as an immigrant and an Iranian uh, uh, lesbian was uh, pretty lonely. I honestly didn't have... Um, any mentors, uh, any lesbian mentors, uh, until I moved to West Hollywood and I actually met Marna, who is one of my lesbian mentors, who connected me with Ivy Bottini uh, when I decided to run for office in West Hollywood in 2019. And um, I went to Ivy's house uh, and she literally gave me the third degree for 45 minutes, asking me all sorts of questions to see um, if she would be able to support me. And uh, she spent time focusing on West Hollywood. She then spent time telling me about all of the incredible, incredible things she's done for our community. She didn't make it about her. She really focused on WeHo. And I was just completely in love with her. And, and I just from that, I um, was so fond of her and we became friends and she did support me and she became my mentor right up until um, uh, her passing. And um, my other mentor is Robin Tyler and I just feel so blessed. I've heard others, including Nadia, talk about how she was a mentor and it's so important. And it's so important for us as lesbians to have role models and mentors. And I'm um, deeply touched by what everyone is sharing. and. I wish I knew Ivy when I was a lot younger, uh, but I'm so grateful that I did get to know her at such an important time. And um, she was able to touch my life as well. So thank you. Love you, Ivy. Thank you so much, Seppi. That was great. Um, next, we have John Erickson. John, would you like to mute yourself and turn on your camera, please? I, I don't know if I can turn on my camera because I've been crying too much and I, I don't personally know if my if I, I need to show that to everyone because these stories, these tributes, everything has just been so beautiful. Bravo to everyone and all that was done. Um, 
I just wanted to say that, you know, Ivy has such a special place in so many of our hearts and um, I'm going to cry again. Um, and to have that impact on one person is a great joy, but to have that impact on the world is a, is a really big responsibility. And Ivy took that and never gave up on the next generation, her generation, calling out people. We all have our great favorite stories of Ivy screaming <laughs> at council meetings. I remember as an intern when I was like, who is this? And then they're like, that's Ivy Botini. And I said, well, I got to meet her. I mean, everyone always has that Ivy story. But I think uh, if there is uh, one thing that uh, I really take to heart, it's um, when we were doing the vagina monologues, um, Ivy would talk to every cast member. And it wasn't just you know, a, hey, how are you? I'm Ivy. She sat them all down and let, let their hearts become joined and the care and compassion she put into everything. is just truly touching. And she changed so many people's lives. And it really shows. So thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Be well. Looking forward to seeing you at Crescent Heights in Santa Monica sometime soon under Ivy's tree. Thank you, John. I'll, I'll be under Ivy's tree too. <laughs> um, next we have Marna. Marna, do you want to um, unmute and talk? Hi, everyone. Uh, I think I had, Ivy and I shared an office together when we both worked at Frontiers for a while. And I think I had the honor of actually teaching her how to Google herself. And her expression, I just wanted to share with you when I talked her through it and she saw all the hits that came up under her name was just like, ah, eyes got wide. And she was just so amazed that there was so much information on her out there and her humbleness with everything that she did. I was able to see every day as, as we would walk together and people would recognize her. And she was always actually at that time, she was in her seventies. She was surprised that people remembered her and knew who she was and she was so flattered by it. Um, but I loved our last conversation as I, as I told Karen Oakham and she reported in her article about it. I spoke to Ivy just a little bit before she passed and I was talking to her because I always talk to her about things that uh, I needed to get done, movements or activism work that I was doing. But we, we dealt with things very differently and we talked about it and then when we were done talking about it, we said our, I love you, so I'll speak to you soon. And Ivy thought she hung up the phone. So I, I had the opportunity, my last hearing of Ivy's voice in my head was getting an opportunity to hear Ivy say, why does she always ask me for my advice if she's never gonna take it? And that was our relationship and I treasure it and I treasure those last words. Thank you, Marna. Um, if Shelly is here, Shelly, can you uh, join us and unmute yourself? Yes. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. I share, I've stopped crying so I can speak now, but I want to share uh, how Ivy affected national politics and national concept of feminism and lesbianism. When 1977, I had the honor of working with her for International Women's Year, the conference that Carter paid for. And Ivy and several of us changed the delegation. There was a delegation for California. And in fact, it was not picked by us. And Ivy and a few other people said, we're gonna change it. So we called it the orange slate. I think Roberta Bennett was part of it too. And we put 11 lesbians in place of 11 people we didn't really know. And we picked some real important people and, and kicked them off the slate, hit the bars in West Hollywood. All the men came. It was an amazing thing to for, pass the slate in California. But beyond that, we went to Houston with 11 lesbians on the slate and Ivy and the 
community men and women brought out 7,000 members that were not delegates to change the agenda of the International Women's Year that went to the President of the United States. It was a great time and she was a great effect. Thank and you. I, I, did, I wanted that to be added. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Thank you for sharing that. We have two more people to share stories, and then it'll be time to wrap up. Um, so the next person is listed under 275464. If we can get them here, they're added to the room, and we'll have them unmute and tell their story. Well, the person on the phone can unmute, but you can unmute yourself. It looks like they're having trouble unmuting themselves. Let's let's give them a moment and see if uh, we can go on to an, uh, another story. And they're calling in with the phone number starting with 310. If we can patch um, the 310 caller in to share their story. You can try star six to unmute if if that works for you. Star nine could also work. Try both. Star six to unmute. Oh, okay, we can hear you now. I wasn't expecting to uh, be speaking. I just wanted to um, pay my respects. Um, uh, the only story I really kind of have um, <clears throat> is uh, um, I, I met Ivy uh, later on in her life after she basically lost her um, uh, most of her vision and uh, but uh, she, she'd always uh, <clears throat> be able to, I guess, maybe recognize my voice or maybe uh, the side of her eyes. She could tell who I was. But uh, she, and she'd always say, I know who you are. I know you're a friend of Betsy's, um, but I can never remember your name. I hope you. And, and it was like, it didn't matter to me. I was just, I was just really. Um, so. Um, odd that she would even remember who I was and uh because I knew who she was and um um I was, I was just so um amazed um <clears throat> whenever she'd come up to me and just just say hello I was just I don't think I even knew how how happy she would make me um and uh, she always made me feel um welcome where whenever um we we run into each other, um, and she's just an incredible person who um, who um, whom, whom we we should remember. Um, our, uh, now that I know that she has a tree, I will I will uh, uh, I will go there, and um, I'd like to make it an annual thing. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing that. I think we're going to have uh, one more story if Marie Cartier is uh, out there and available to speak, join the screen. Um, Marie, are you there? Sorry, we're adding you at the last minute. Yes. Yes. Can you see? Yeah. Hey. Yes, we can see you. Hey. Um, I just, I guess I have Ivy's drawing table and I'm so pleased to have it. Um, and 
to have the table of an artist like Ivy and to be an artist myself. And I guess uh, I sat next to Ivy during all of our WeHo productions of the vagina monologues. And I think I just put in the chat that I can hear Ivy right now um, yelling into the space next to you and I, Karen, you know, when she would just say, my vagina, you know, what does my vagina want? And you're whispering, <laughs> my vagina was, and then she would be mad at you because, you know, she's got her lines, but then she'd forget her lines and she'd like, I've got it, I've got it, you know? And then she just yelling, my vagina wants everything, you know? Um, <laughs> And she would be saying things to me and you. And I just, um, I interviewed Ivy for my book, Baby, You're My Religion. And Ivy was always, I just uh, love some of these. I love that story that Marna said where, you know, she hung up the phone and Ivy's like, why did she take my advice? I mean, she was so honest. You always knew with Ivy, you were getting um, the real deal. There wasn't another story. You were getting the real deal. And I think if I could just say, you know, let's get everything. That was Ivy's motto. Let's get every fucking thing that we can get. Let's get it and ask for it. Because if you don't ask for it, you won't get it. You know, you want the Statue of Liberty, then go get it. And so uh, I'll end with that. My vagina wants chocolate. My vagina wants everything. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> um, uh... And thank you for ending it on a high note, because honestly, Ivy would want us celebrating her life, um, though I'm sure she wouldn't mind that we're shedding a couple of tears, too, because I think everyone here has one thing in common, at least one thing in common, and that is we all have a hole in our hearts where Ivy used to be. Well, she's still there, um, and there'll never be another Ivy. Thank you so much for coming to this event. Thank you on behalf of um, the organizers and One Archives. And I would just ask, please stay and watch the credits because we used a lot of materials and a lot of photos. And there were a lot of people who contributed to make this event what it was. And I would like you to see who all was behind this. Thank you very much.